on uh, to be responsible and do their part in maintaining this downward trend. Uh, Baltimore has the lowest positivity rate across the state. Let's keep it that way. I've spent uh, the last few days evaluating where we are uh, with cases, positivity, hospitalizations, and death with the health commissioner and our partners. Additionally, uh, as Judge Fletcher noted, Fletcher Hill noted in his opinion last week, I have and will continue to evaluate the economic impact of these restrictions. Uh, that is exactly why we are reviewing the data daily. Uh, with the most uh, recent leveling in cases and uh, to address the imp economic impact of COVID-19, I have made the decision to adjust our city's COVID-19 mandates, which will be in effect for the next four weeks at least. Uh, outdoor dining will now be permitted at 50% capacity and at a one hour uh, max time limit. The flaps of any type of coverings must be open. Indoor dining will be allowed at 25% capacity at a one hour max time limit. Restaurants must keep a sign in sign out sheet of, of patrons as they are seated for both indoor and outdoor dining. Uh, bars without food licenses will also be allowed to reopen at 50% outdoor capacity and 25% indoor capacity with the one hour uh, time limit and a sign in sign out sheet as well. This also includes our breweries. Gym classes uh, will be permitted to resume socially distanced with masks required and limited to 10 person. All indoor recreation sites, with the exception of adult entertainment and hookah, hookah and cigar lounges, will be permitted to reopen at 25% capacity. Hookah and cigar lounges are allowed to keep their retail sales open at 25% capacity, but must remain uh, close to on-site consumption. Finally, uh, streaming of live performances will be permitted from our venues. Outdoor gatherings will remain at a 25-person limit. Indoor gatherings will remain at a, at the 10-person limit. Maximum occupancy will continue to be determined by the fire code rated occupancy. Uh, these new mandates will take effect in Baltimore this Friday, January 22nd at 6 a.m. Uh, the effective date and time is based on feedback that I received uh, from our restaurants. We understand and we heard from them loud and clear uh, that more notice is needed to reduce uh, services rather than to reopen them and that 5 p.m. Uh, was a tough time to ensure that they are ready to uh, resume business. I am proud of our residents who for the work that they have put in to see this drop in numbers, uh, but urge everyone to stay cautious and proactive. Uh, let me be very clear. We are still in a pandemic that is taking away our family, our community, our neighbors and friends, and we must continue to take that seriously. I am excited for our restaurants to resume their service, and I look forward to keeping our line of communication open, as well as to continue to navigate this pandemic together. Uh, and just a, a quick update from that meeting on Sunday, I met virtually uh, with members of the restaurant industry from all over Baltimore City to discuss uh, the continuing economic impacts of COVID on their staff uh, and their management and ownership and their workers. I appreciate uh, the candor and the bluntness of the conversation. I also appreciate uh, the breadth of experience and information shared and where adjustments can be made uh, and the need to be made in city government's response to COVID-19 and its impacts on their industry and their workers. Our restaurants and their employees have suffered tremendously uh, throughout this pandemic. There is no doubt about that. And I'm committed to continue to look for ways to support this industry, continuing to do that and everyone impacted by this pandemic. I will be working with my team in the coming days and weeks to identify additional avenues of support and continue uh, to call on Baltimoreans to support our restaurants in whatever way that you can. Uh, to date, BDC, the Baltimore De uh, Development Corporation, has supported over 2,000 small businesses. BC, BDC has made over 1,000 grants to small businesses. More than 1,300 businesses were served through uh, the technical assistance network that we were provided. In all, over $15 million in support has been distributed, including more than $13 million in grants. 
500,000 in locally made PPE procurement and equipment grants uh, and designed for distancing imp implemented across 16 commercial districts in Baltimore. I think this is very important for everyone to understand is that BDC did not take applications on a first come first serve basis and instead prioritize businesses most in need and support with a focus on equitable distribution of funds to ensure that black and brown businesses were not shut out of this process as we've seen uh, with some of the other uh, funds that have been made available at other levels. In the coming weeks, uh, BDC will be announcing a new $3.9 million round of grants for restaurants. I additionally, I am pleased to announce additional support uh, for our local businesses this morning. As of this morning, I am reopening the outdoor dining and street closure program. With this fund, restaurants can apply for reimbursement for city and state fees associated with outdoor table service. Uh, businesses can be reimbursed up to $800 for minor privilege fees and health inspection costs. Uh, the online rebate submission form is now live. Restaurants encouraged to apply online on the Baltimore Civics Funds website. You just need to provide your contact information, vendor uh, W-9, app applicable fee invoices, and proof of payment. And we thank uh, the Baltimore Civic Fund for making this possible. Uh, I want to, to switch gears here a little bit to discuss vaccines. It is imperative uh, that we implement a coherent, collaborative, and equitable approach to scaling up vaccination in Baltimore City. I've been working closely with our health department and our hospital partners as we work to ramp up our ability to vaccinate Baltimoreans. I want to thank Under Armour for the support that they provided us thus far in vaccinating people who live and work here in Baltimore City. And today, I am thrilled to announce a new vaccination site at Baltimore City Community College, or as we know it here, BCCC. Uh, this site will be operational next week. Given that it's certainly uh, cent is centrally located and easily accessible by transit, I am confident that this site will allow Baltimore to increase our capacity to vaccinate our residents. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. DeRosa for more information about where we stand with case numbers and with vaccinations in Baltimore. Dr. DeRosa. Good morning, and thank you, Mayor Scott, for continuing to lead and inform the public about Baltimore City's COVID-19 response. I'd like to share data on our COVID-19 metrics here in Baltimore City. As of yesterday, as Mayor Scott noted, we have lost 705 lives to COVID-19. We have seen a decrease in fatalities, now averaging slightly less than three deaths a day. This is a 37% decrease from where we were four weeks ago. We have had a total of 35,936 cases in the city, and our latest seven-day average new case count is 239 cases per day. Our latest seven-day average positivity is 6.2%. Our hospital utilization rates, as Mayor Scott noted, have decreased slightly, but do remain high with intensive care units at 88% capacity and our acute care units following closely behind at 86% capacity. Last week, I mentioned that our case data over the last month saw a slight dip in new cases towards the end of December, only to see another spike of cases in the first week and a half or so of January. With the latest data and with our hospitalizations, fatalities, and case count beginning to trend downwards, we're cautiously optimistic that we may have reached a tipping point. Again, cautiously optimistic that we may have reached a tipping point. However, the reopening of outdoor dining and limited indoor dining comes with a reminder that these are still locations where masking, one of the best ways to reduce the spread of novel coronavirus, cannot be maintained at all time. I urge residents to continue to be cautious and to provide up-to-date contact information to the restaurants who will now be required to have sign-in sheets so that our contact tracers can quickly notify you if an outbreak occurs. Turning towards vaccination, to date, the Baltimore City Health Department has provided 4,373 doses of vaccine as of yesterday. Today, thanks to the hard work of our COVID-19 vaccination teams, I'm excited to announce the creation of a new vaccination clinic at Baltimore City Community College beginning on Monday, January 25th. We'd like to thank Under Armour for all of their support in the earliest phase of the city's vaccination rollout, and we'll be winding down our operations at Port Covington this week. Baltimore City Community College's proximity to the transportation hub at Mondawmin Mall and its location in West Baltimore will help us improve access to the site for those who rely on public transit. 
All those with a second dose scheduled at Port Covington will be emailed by our team in the next few days regarding the location change of your appointment so that you can be uh, aware and prep to go to our new site at BCCC. Appointment times will not change. As a reminder, the Baltimore City Health Department's appointments for the coronavirus vaccine for the month of January were taken within the first 24 hours of Governor Hogan's announcement of Maryland moving to Phase 1B. From a very high level, the sudden influx of interest from the public shows that many Baltimore residents are excited to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. However, the overwhelming of the online appointment system so early in the vaccination process reignited internal concerns in the health department about how older adults and members of the public without access to the internet will schedule their vaccination appointments. As it stands, the current use of an internet-only appointment system promotes the inequitable distribution of vaccines by funneling appointments through internet access. A recent ABLE report indicates that up to 40% of households in Baltimore do not have access to the internet, making this situation inexcusable for Baltimore City residents. To address this concern, members of the Health Department's Division of Aging and Care Services have created a workaround. Beginning today, older adults without internet access in phases 1A and 1B can now call 410-396-CARE. Again, that's 410-396-2273 for assistance in scheduling a coronavirus vaccine appointment once they become available. I'd like to thank the members in our Division of Aging who have been working tirelessly and under immense pressure to put additional access points in place for our older residents. This week, older adults in Baltimore City who qualify as members of Priority Group 1A and 1B will be asked to leave their contact information with one of our MAP ambassadors when they call, who will then proactively reach back out via phone to let residents know when a vaccination appointment is available. Again, for those older adults age 65 and up with internet access, we have created a vaccine interest form on our website, coronavirus.baltimorecity.gov slash COVAX, C-O-V-A-X, and we encourage you to pre-register for a vaccination appointment. You will also be called back when an appointment becomes available. This is the first in a series of steps we are taking to accelerate the development of protocols to secure vaccination appointments by phone and other non-internet based methods. And over the weeks to come, we will be making more announcements along this theme. You will hear me say this often over the next few weeks, but please be patient, Baltimore. Again, I am reassured by the overwhelming interest many residents have in getting vaccinated. We have seen tremendous demand for this vaccine, but we're only in the first month of what will be a sustained campaign over the coming months. We're working to set up more vaccination sites around the city, including other mass vaccination sites capable of serving more residents than what our current capacity allows. Planning decision around vaccine access points are made thoughtfully and based on previous experience establishing vaccine spots. Where we put new vaccination sites, we have to consider who will staff them and how people will get there through the, ends of, through the lens of equity. This is all made all the more clear by the disproportionate impact this pandemic has had on our most vulnerable populations. Information related to our vaccine rollout, again, is available and updated regularly on our website coronavirus.baltimorecity.gov slash COVAX, as well as on our social media accounts. In the meantime, please continue to wash your hands, maintain social distancing, and wear a mask in public to reduce the chances of disease transmission. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Raza. As the Health Commissioner said, we are committed uh, and continuously working to expand Baltimore's vaccination capacity uh, in a safe and equitable way and will and always will keep you updated as we move forward. Uh, and also just want to re-highlight again, uh, based on the go ahead I received last week uh, from Governor Hogan, uh, my team and I are continuing to have conversations with private sector partners about uh, these efforts so that we can expand our vaccination capacity and we will have to, more to report on that and announce in the near future. And as I've said before, uh, even as we add capacity for additional staffing and sites, it will take time to get everyone vaccinated because of our reliance on the doses available to us. I continue to ask residents to stay vigilant in the fight against COVID and be patient as we move through uh, the prioritizations. We will continue to work around the clock uh, to expand our distribution plan and begin administrating uh, the COVID-19 vaccine to more Baltimoreans each and every day. Uh, thank you. Now we'll take a few questions.
Okay. Decision. Uh, the is this a, kind of a compromise with restaurants? Is this something they've had input with in terms of the hour limit, uh, which is a new feature that that other jurisdictions have not done? Is this something that was their suggestion? No, actually, Jane, that was not one of their suggestions. But this is uh, again. Uh, this is again. Uh, this decision I, we would not have made if the health commissioner uh, and our other folks didn't think it was safe for us to do it uh, based on where we are. We are going to see how this works. We're going to, to make sure and be out working alongside our restaurants and other folks to make sure that folks are following the rules. Uh, but we are, we are doing this now as we're going to, just like we did with the first one, we're going to look at it over the next four weeks to see where we are. And we're just hopeful uh, that we're able to, to keep them open and hopeful, uh, as, as Dr. Raza said, that our cases continue to go the way that they have. Next, Alexa. Hi, a uh, question about vaccines, if I could, from yep. the, to the health commissioner. Um, you said the 4,000 total uh, administered about that number. Do you have a breakdown of what that is a day that the health department and um, providers are administering the COVID vaccine a day? Um, so we do have breakdown. And so you say the health department and providers, we have visibility into vaccines that we provide at our vaccine pods. Um, we don't have visibility into what the hospitals are providing every single day, if that's the question. Yeah, that one. And then with the uh, the guidance of the, um, some providers have expressed that there's been uh, those extra doses and the flexibility uh, with administering those. Is the city preparing any type of guidance for that? Uh, do you see that flexibility loosening at all? Uh, and so guidance around what to do with the extra doses? Yes. Um, so, I mean, I think we would just follow the continued um, prioritization, right? So now we're in phase 1B, and so there, there is right now a, a demand that really does exceed supply. Um, and so I think that, you know, many hospitals are, are really looking at that priority list to, to determine where to provide those extra doses. All right, thank you. Hi, also with regard to vaccines, can you talk about how many vaccines the city now has and ideally how many vaccines it needs to fulfill phase 1B and then ultimately phase 1C? So we have rough estimates that phase uh, 1A was about 10 to 11,000 individuals. Um, and phase 1A is gonna be, again, it's a mix. So it's gonna be hospital-based healthcare workers. Um, we didn't discriminate if you live or work in, in Baltimore City and you're a part of phase 1A, we did vaccinate you. So likely are vaccinating individuals who aren't um, city residents, um, but again, work in the city. And so again, we're covering phase 1A, but so are hospitals. Um, and we don't have all the visibility into how many vaccines that hospitals have provided. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not sure if that answers your question about how many people fall into category 1B? So 1B is a bit more expansive. Um, so 1B is, is about 60,000 folks, roughly. And about how many vaccines do we have on hand right now? So Baltimore City Health Department has close to 12,000 vaccines. Well, we've distributed over 4,000, so we have the remainder out of the 12,000. But again, hospitals get their own allocations that don't come through the local health department, and they distribute them as they see fit. Thank you. Can you talk a little about the decision um, that went into the one hour time limit because you know surrounding counties have been able to operate safely without such a restriction? Well, it's, it's about, it's, and I know this is something that some of the surrounding counties have considered. Uh, it's about, again, trying to limit the amount of time that people are gonna be in, the, in that kind of situation, but also uh, thinking about it from, from the business owner's point of view too and not allowing them in the limited capacity to have more people come throughout their, through their doors throughout the day. Did your meeting with them ultimately really influence this decision to get them back open? This, this decision, uh, the decision that I made on how we're doing it and how we're announcing it, uh, when we're announcing it, the time that we're given, uh, was made with their suggestion. But uh, the decision to reopen was made simply from a question being asked to the health commissioner if it's okay for us to do this at this point. That is never going to change with me. This is going to be about how we're being guided by this. We have to balance, but we ultimately have to be thinking about health. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Dave, last question. Dave, Channel 2. Yep. In relation to the flaps that you mentioned, is it 50% or is it all the flaps must be up? The flaps must be open. I'll let the health commissioner go directly into it, but we just want to be clear. If you have tents and they're covered on all four sides, that's not indoor, outdoor dining, that's indoor. 
Yeah, so I mean, the mayor stated it perfectly, right? The, we don't want to turn outdoor dining into indoor dining, and we really want it to be open and for there to be airflow if you are going to do outdoor dining. And just lastly, I know um, any update regarding the trauma training and where those numbers stand as we approach the 30 day mark? Yeah, we'll, we'll, once the 30 day mark is up, you'll get back from us, Dave, of who we've all been through it and who's going to be next in that round. But be sure we'll be communicating that out publicly. Unrelated to the um, COVID situation, is there an up, any update or where do you stand, and this is also for the commissioner, on the investigation of the murder of Dante Barksdale, obviously a high profile case? Yep. Is there I'll, anything you can say and what, and what you may need to advance the investigation? Well, we know uh, before the commissioner comes up, Jane, we know that we, we have now put out, we are offering up to $7,000 for information. We need anybody that has information to come forward, as we always do. As I said to you on Friday in the case with the two young women that murdered, we need people to come up and, and step forward. I'll let the commissioner give an update about where we are with the tragedy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Jane, without going into specifics, we're still following leads. We're pursuing leads. We have some information, but we need more. And we are encouraging anybody who knows anything or who has heard anything about what happened out there to contact us or contact Crime Stoppers, which they can do anonymously. Here's what we know. We know that there were people out there. And we know that uh, it was it was more than just one. We know that there were people out there. So we are encouraging people, anyone who has any information, to contact us or contact Crime Stoppers. Investigators are pursuing leads around the clock. And, you know, everything that we have, all of our resources, are working this and other murders right now to make sure we hold people accountable and, and give justice. And just before we close, I, I also wanted to just uh, acknowledge the report that was released yesterday by the ACO in Maryland around, regarding police misconduct. Uh, I want to be clear, uh, my administration, under, under my administration, BPD will be a more transparent and accountable agency. I'm pleased with the reforms that we've put in place thus far, uh, but I'm anxious to see and know that we're going to continue to tackle uh, systematic issues in BPD that have allowed for uh, people to... Uh, dismantle trust in the agency and for our city to become a safer city we have to and we will through the consent decree and other reforms uh, make BPD a beacon of light of how we can return uh, a return and restore trust in an agency thank you